basically what we're doing uh, leading up to Easter is we're looking at some of the last things that Jesus said because, you know, like Webby said in our very first uh, week, what somebody chooses to say at the very end of their lives should be given extra attention or extra consideration because it's extra meaningful. So uh, if you are here for the first time today, um, you picked a great uh, time to be here. And let me just say this. If you are, in fact, here for the first time ever, God bless you, okay? Because here's the thing. Last week, uh, our family was on vacation, and we went to a church that we had never been to before, okay? And I would love to tell you that everything was super smooth, but that would be a lie, Okay, we woke up and I said, we're going to be on time. Uh, and spoiler alert, we were not on time. Um, we got into the van and I had forgotten to get a dirty diaper out of there. And so I, yeah, exactly. Uh, you guys are a lot nicer about it than the rest of the family was. Uh, <laughs> it, it was not ideal. And so our ride to church was not pleasant. Um, in fact, the, in order to get to the church building, like you had to cross like this interstate of like traffic, like this giant highway, and it's like head on, and they're going like a hundred miles an hour. And in fact, if I remember correctly, like that particular road started somewhere like Panama City, and I think it ended in hell or something. Uh, like that's it, it was that's where they were. It was terrible. Okay, um, so we turn in there, and we were literally that family that. Like we're arguing walking into church because we're late and there's a poopy diaper in the car and we're on the most dangerous interstate ever. And and so here, here's the thing. Uh, it kind of ruined worship for me. And if you are here today for the first time, again, God bless you. And if you happen to be here and it's not necessarily your first time, but you came in here arguing with your spouse because your husband is an idiot or because you were not on time, let me just say this. If you are here right now, like that's what matters. Okay? You can't turn back the clock. What matters is you are here. Don't let all the stuff that led up to this moment keep you from hearing what God might want to say to you today. Okay, Um, so like I said, we were on vacation and I love vacation. And one of the things that we did uh, while we were on vacation is we watched a lot of Scooby Doo. Okay, I've told you many times that I like a good mystery and we watched a lot of Scooby Doo, not necessarily because Judah likes Scooby Doo, but (laughs) because dad likes Scooby Doo. And I don't want to brag, but I've gotten to the place where I can I can pretty much tell you who the uh, the bad guy is going to be in Scooby Doo. All right. Now, it's either because it's a show for six-year-olds or because I should have been a detective. Um, but here's the thing. and I'm, Because I like you, because we're friends, because I care about you, I'm going to let you in on the secret about how you find out who the bad guy is in Scooby-Doo before the rest of your friends. Okay, so show starts and the, you know, Mystery Incorporated team, you know, Shaggy and Fred and Scooby and Velma, they, they, they all show up there, and Daphne, we can't forget Daphne, and they, they roll up to some spooky house or amusement park or whatever, and this is how you know who the bad guy is. All right? There are going to be two characters that aren't a part of the Mystery Incorporated team there, and you know, so like if they roll up to a mansion, and there's the guy who lives at the mansion and his gardener, and they're both like, yeah, we saw the ghost of the old prospector, and he told us to get out immediately, or else you can pretty much be certain that like uh, one of those two guys are going to be the bad guy, you know, the ghost of the old prospector. You just have to, to tell, you know, determine who's got the, uh, the, the better motive, all right? So you go home, watch some Scooby-Doo with your family. You're going to look like a genius, I promise. Um, but I love a good mystery. And here's the really interesting thing about, about what we're talking about this morning. Um, we we kind of do this in everyday life. Most of us spend a good deal of time trying to figure other people out and trying to determine whether they are good or bad. So let me give you an example. Maybe uh, you had a teacher or a boss, and um, you were convinced that they had it in for you, right? Like you would go to work or you would go to school, and it would seem like, 
everybody would be able to get away with, like, essentially murder. They would get away with this or they would get away with that. And for some reason, that teacher or that boss would single you out and they would give you a hard time, right? They didn't seem to appreciate how hard you worked or they didn't seem to care about all the obstacles that you've had to overcome. And they certainly seemed to be more on your case than on everybody else's. You would have concluded that they're out to get you or that they were bad. Or maybe you grew up and you had like a friend or a best friend maybe and you had the secret that you shared with them and you know you leaned in and you whispered in their ear this secret this deep dark secret that you didn't want anybody else to know and like two and a half hours later it seems like everybody kind of knows this deep dark secret that you didn't want anybody else to know and you maybe go to your friend and you say what's the deal Right? You're the only person that knew who let the cat out of the bag. And so you start to you know, put the clues together and you determine that your friend has betrayed you, that your friend has stabbed you in the back. You see, we gather evidence, we use clues, we build a case, and we conclude who's good and who's bad. And believe it or not, this isn't something that we just do with people. We don't just limit this kind of judgment to people. If we're being totally honest here this morning, there have probably been times when each of us have gathered evidence and built a case in which we concluded that God must be a bad guy. Maybe you grew up and the picture of God that you had in your mind was of this angry old guy with this long flowing white beard. Or perhaps you thought of God like a police officer who was just waiting to pull you over for breaking the law. Or like some referee keeping track of all of your fouls, just waiting to toss you out of the game. Or or maybe like many of us, you prayed prayers that seemingly went unanswered. That they fell on deaf ears. That you prayed for relief from a particular challenge and all you got was more of the same. And so you just kind of grew up thinking that God was like the grumpy old lunch lady plopping stuff down on the tray of your life and snarling underneath his breath that you ought to be thankful for what you're getting. You see, in a mystery, when you think you've got someone pegged as a bad guy, it can be really hard to see them in any other way. So I was in the third grade. And in the third grade, that was the year that we had to start learning all the states in the United States and all of their capitals. And for me personally, like, I love that. Like, that's, that's right up my alley. I like geography. I like history and stuff like that. And so uh, I, was, I was totally cool with this. And we had this pop quiz this one day. And, you know, so the teacher hands us this sheet of paper, and we got to list all this stuff. Now, here's the thing. While I really liked geography and history and that kind of stuff, and that came really naturally for me, um, I had this bad habit of sometimes forgetting to put my name on my test, which is not a good quality. But here's the thing. Um, So a guy who sat three seats down from me, he was a friend of mine. Maybe not my best friend, but he was a friend of mine. His name was Adam. He sat three seats down from me, and he did not care so much for geography or history or things like that. And so when it came time to turn in our, like, pop quiz that day, we pass our tests down. And do you know what that scoundrel did? You know what he did. He put his name on my test. I'll say this. We uh, weren't as close of friends after this particular incident. Because here's the thing. Um, When you have someone pegged as a bad guy, it's hard to see them in any other way. In life, when we think we know someone like God, for example, is bad, it can be nearly impossible to develop an active, growing relationship with them. 
But here's the thing. Perception is not always reality. The fact is, how we feel about God doesn't always accurately represent what is true about God. In fact, there's a passage in the New Testament that illustrates this point perfectly. It takes place during a time in Jesus' life when he was going through some extremely challenging and terribly uncomfortable circumstances. On the night that he was betrayed by one of his closest friends, mind you, the night he was arrested by the leaders of the Jewish faith, Jesus asked his followers to come with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, why would anybody go to a park at night? Well, Jesus had three good reasons to go to this particular garden on this evening. One, he knew that he was on the verge or on the cusp of something incredibly painful. Second, he wanted to talk about that thing with his heavenly father. And finally, he wanted his friends there for support. Luke records it this way in his gospel. In chapter 22, verse 39 begins this way. It says, Then, accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, Pray that you will not give into temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Now, this passage paints a beautiful picture of all the raw vulnerability of Jesus. You see, we sometimes get this idea in our mind that Jesus is like this robot who didn't feel or didn't have emotions, that he was devoid of such things and nothing could be further from the truth. Yes, Jesus was fully God, but he was also 100% man. And like any man or any human in this room, he had no desire to chug down a thermos full of suffering. And in Jesus' moment of intense uncertainty and fear, his first response was to look up to his heavenly Father and ask, for help. See, here's the thing. We will turn and look toward heaven when things don't seem to go our way as well. It's just we don't always do it in the same way that Jesus did. Too often when we look upward, our tendency is to blame God, to accuse God, to ask him where he was. How could he have dropped the ball? Why did he allow this particular thing to happen in our lives? And it isn't long before we start to creep down the path of believing that God is the source of our problems and is, in fact, the bad guy. Maybe we give God the cold shoulder after something like that, or maybe we start to bargain with him. You know, we think that we're being punished for something that we've done, and so we start to think, well, um, God... uh, I'm sorry, I'll be different, I'll be better, I'll stop doing that thing, I'll start going to that place, I'll, I'll never touch that thing again. Like, whatever, just make this situation better. Just fix this thing that's happening. While God can handle our raw, vulnerable outbursts, because He wants us to be honest with Him as well as honest with ourselves, this speaks volumes about how we view God and the underlying questions that we have about His character. Questions like, can I trust God? Will God take care of me? Is God really, no, no, really, is God really good? And this is where Jesus' example here in the garden is so incredibly powerful. 
In the midst of all this uncertainty and all this fear, Jesus reaches out to his loving Father and he looks up to heaven and asks God for help, but immediately follows his request in this way. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Think about this. Mere moments away from betrayal and arrest and torture, Jesus basically looks up to heaven and says, God, I trust you no matter what happens. Isn't it impressive that Jesus, in the midst of such discomfort and such uncertainty, was able to remain consistent? Like Webby said, When Jesus taught his followers to pray, he said, Your kingdom come, your will be done. And Jesus was able to continue to say that in the midst of such a circumstance. See, Jesus did something that we often forget to do. Even when circumstances don't make sense, when fear seems overwhelming or the future seems unbearable, He chose to approach God and trust Him based on what He knew was true about God rather than through the lens of His present circumstances. And make no mistake, it takes an extraordinary amount of trust in God to face extraordinarily difficult circumstances. But Jesus knew that His Father was good. Jesus knew that his father was loving. Jesus knew that his father had a bigger picture in mind. And maybe most importantly, Jesus knew that whatever he faced, his heavenly father would be right there with him. And here's the deal. Knowing this, knowing all of these things about God, didn't change his circumstances. Knowing all this didn't change what Jesus was feeling in that moment. In fact, if you read on to verse 44, it tells us that Jesus started to literally sweat drops of blood. But trusting God, it's not about getting our way. Trusting God isn't about making all the stars align for us. Trusting God isn't about all of our situations and all of our circumstances aligning the way that they should. Trusting God is about remembering His character and who He really is when nothing else makes sense. Make no mistake, you and I are going to face nights like Jesus did. We're going to face difficult situations. We're going to have to go through tough circumstances. And if we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to imitate Him, we must learn to trust God even when we don't understand what's going on in the world around us. Like Jesus, you and I have permission to go to our Heavenly Father And be real with Him. And in those moments, we have the opportunity to blame God or lean on Him. To see Him as the bad guy or as our source of strength and peace. And if that sounds impossible to you, if that sounds like a fairy tale, I would simply encourage you to crack open your Bibles and spend time getting to know who God actually is. To continually remind yourself of what you know to be true about God, that He is loving, that He is compassionate, that He is gracious, that He is kind, that He is good, that He is for you, and that He is with you, especially when you hurt. Many of you are probably familiar with the Netflix documentary series Making a Murderer. And if you're not, it chronicles much of the life of a guy named Stephen Avery. 
who in 1985 was convicted in the brutal attack of a woman in broad daylight. Stephen Avery spent 18 years in prison as a result of this conviction. The thing is, though, uh, um, Stephen Avery had an alibi for the time in question. He was able to even prove, you know, with receipts, like I was at this place, not at this place. What makes things even more suspicious is a man who had been in jail for similar acts had just been released. And this particular individual had been known to frequent the area where the attack occurred. And perhaps most troubling of all, in 1995, 10 years into the 18 years that Stephen Avery spent in prison, this particular individual confessed to the crime. And Stephen Avery spent eight more years in prison while technology was able to catch up and ultimately prove what he'd said all along. I'm not the bad guy. Now, make, make no mistake, Stephen Avery, certainly no saint. He's no angel. He's a human being like the rest of us. In fact, he might have more stuff going on than anybody in this room. But the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department insisted that they had the bad guy, even when the evidence pointed them in another direction. When we see someone as the bad guy, it can be hard to unsee them that way. In this instance, the real attacker was able to roam free hurting people for ten more years. When our problems or our painful circumstances cause us to see God as the bad guy, the real culprit is allowed to continue hurting us and hurting others as well. We must fight to trust God based on the truth of His character and not on our circumstances. Maybe you're in here this morning and you grew up and the picture of God that you had in your mind was of the old guy with the white beard who was always angry. Or maybe the picture that you had in your mind was of the cop that's looking to toss you in jail or of the referee that's looking to kick you out of the game. Or maybe of the old lunch lady that's just plopping stuff down on the tray of your life, telling you to take what you get and be quiet. That is not an accurate picture of God, and that is not the real Jesus. And so what I want to invite you today to consider, who is Jesus really? Who is God at his core? Jesus was able to trust him in the midst of something terrible. And I submit to you this morning, so can you. Regardless of what you've always thought about God, he is for you. And he proved it when he sent his son to the cross on your behalf and on mine. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never repented of your sins and been baptized into him, you can do that today.